If you search the Process Church of the Final Judgment online, you will discover a long list of lurid conspiracy theories. The cult has been accused of being the inspiration for Charles Manson's crimes of the century, influencing the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, and being the root of the notorious Son of Sam serial killings. Formed in 1960s England, many of the process's members were drawn from wealthy families and aristocracy. Newspapers branded them the Mind Benders in Mayfair and the Devil's Disciples. Thing is, former members seem to have taken a vow of silence and secrecy. They've stayed hush on the group's beliefs, rituals, and closely guarded secrets, and they haven't addressed even the most mundane of the conspiracy theories levied against them. Until now. Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O'Culture, where we're putting the cult back in O'Cult this time around. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D program. Thanks for being here. A lot of names on the marquee for this one, and that's because we're discussing the Process Church of the Final Judgment with a few folks who know a thing or two about it. First up, Neil Edwards, the director and producer, and, well, he did about everything for his documentary on the Process Church. It's called Sympathy for the Devil? And after more than two years of screening the film, it's finally out for mass consumption on home video, so dust off that VCR because it's well worth the time. Neil's film gets behind the veils of the cult known as the Process and tracks their journey from their formation in London's prestigious Mayfair district through wilderness experiences in Mexico, flirtations with pop royalty, and their spread stateside that resulted in them being christened one of the most dangerous satanic cults in America. Neil's documentary features contributions and insights from filmmaker John Waters, musician George Clinton, artist Genesis Peorage, and several renowned authors including Gary Lockman, former guest here. It also features commentary from leading former members of the cult, including Edward Mason, who's also in the house to deliver a ton of inside perspective on the group. And if that isn't enough, we're also joined by Jeff Wolf, who blogs at secrettransmissions.com. Jeff holds a lifelong interest in the theology and psychology of the process. This is Jeff's fourth appearance on the show, and he brought a slew of great questions and insights, especially in the Patreon extension where we went from a foursome to a threesome, and then to just Jeff and I chatting. So, an interesting format and progression here for those of you listening on Patreon. And if you're not, and you want to, and believe me, you'll want to, patreon.com slash oldculture is the place to be. Anyway, enough of my jibber-jabber, let's flip the script from prologue to dialogue and roll the reel on this process peep show. Enjoy. So let's make some quick introductions for the audience here. Uh, Neil Edwards, you're the director of the documentary Sympathy for the Devil? Question mark. The film looks at the true story of the Process Church of the Final Judgment. Neil, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Who would have guessed that when we set this up, this day would coincide with England actually getting through to a quarterfinal in the World Cup? So the timing is extraordinarily bad. But I've got it on the, I've got it on the screen at the moment. We're one, we're one nil up. Oh my goodness, there was just a save, so we nearly went one, one, one. So if I get a bit distracted, you'll know why. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem, not a problem at all. Well, we're also joined by Edward Mason. Edward, you're a former member of the Process Church, known as Brother Luke. Welcome to the show. Thanks for the welcome. I too am watching the game, but I've got all of that muted, so I'll just have to try and smother the noises that Neil is making for us. I will keep myself as quiet as possible on that particular topic. 
Well, I appreciate any attention you can pay us. And then the man with the most appearances on this show, Jeff Wolf from SecretTransmissions.com. Jeff, glad you could join us this morning. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm very excited for this conversation. Definitely, man. So, Edward, let's start with you. There may be some listeners who've never heard of the Process Church or the Final Judgment. So for those who haven't, how would you best describe or characterize the organization? Uh, I think this thing has to wind up in less than three hours, so that's rather the toughest question you could come up with. It was something that was very amoebic in its nature. It looked like a um, psychological cult. Some people thought we were a religion. Others thought we were something from outer space. It was basically, I think, a way of experiencing your own nature, your own sense of destiny or direction in life in a situation that brought out some of the more concealed aspects of your own character. I don't know if that even makes any sense, but it does to me as a quick summary. Yeah, you know, and I would like to get an answer from Neil on that same question because I'm just, I'm curious how the definitions of what it was may differ from person to person. So, Neil, how best would you describe the group? Yeah, well, it's, it, it, you're absolutely right. There are as many descriptions as there are people that have heard of them, really. Because, And in fact, I think you'd probably get a slightly different description from everybody that was once a member. And part of the exploration that the film was undertaking was, you know, just what what is or was the process. I think they were certainly a cult, by the kind of dictionary definition of a cult. Now, of course, the, the, the word cult has got loads of negative baggage associated with it now. That instantly means a bad thing. But, of course, that depends kind of from what angle you're coming from. And um, I think a lot of people would argue, in fact, Timothy Wiley, who's in the film and who sadly passed away fairly recently, said, you know, every great religion starts as a cult. But he did append that with, thank, thank God, as didn't. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so there's so, so they're certainly, I think, a very, very interesting collection of people and probably differ from the traditional cult from the fact that, uh, by the fact that they were, I think, very much individuals bonded together by a spirit of adventure and experimentation. So rather than being kind of mindless drones, as some cults, you know, arguably attract, uh, I think the process was slightly different. But then if you Google them and try and find out what the process is, you would come up with all sorts of stuff, including, you know, the kind of Illuminati that are uh, somehow consumed with a uh, mission to destroy the world in various unpleasant ways, be it serial killing, eating dogs, uh, assassinations of uh, leading people, anything you can think of that's naughty. Yeah, there are definitely some provocative uh, conspiracy theories around the group that we may touch on later, but I want to get a quick impression from Jeff here, too, up front. Jeff, what was your first impression of the Process Church? Well, uh, when I look at it, and my perspective is really from having read a lot of Robert de Grimston's essays and writings and also, you know, corresponding with some former members online as well as kind of going through all the visual ephemera and material. To me, looking at a lot of other esoteric orders, I, I see the process as a, as a sort of initiatory esoteric order with a focus on an eschatology and, um, and be an apocalyptic metaphysics with a very interesting blend of Christian ideas and also psychological Adlerian and Jungian archetypal sort of ideas. So it's to me, it's a very interesting blend of a lot of very different metaphysical systems, but that all coalesced at a period in time, you know, the 60s counterculture that um, I think that has a lot to do with the, the shape and the feel of the organization as well as the, the time period that it developed in in a, a period in the Cold War in the burgeoning Vietnam era is a I think that gives a, a sense of a darkness that comes through in the in the writings that I've read uh, so that that's my impression yeah so three different people three different impressions of what the group is I think that's just fascinating 
So, Neil, you know, obviously this is provocative material and it makes for a hell of a documentary. Let's talk about some discovery stories. When did you first discover the Process Church and then why did you want to make the film as well? It's a really interesting question, that, because I'm not entirely sure when I did discover the Process Church or the Process Church, as we would say over here in England, I've been kind of obsessed with the 1960s since I was an early teenager. I was a little mod in the 80s when there was a big revival of of mod over here in the UK. And from that, that point on, I was just kind of obsessed with everything 60s. And that grew into all aspects, be it, you know, from the music into the fashion, into the politics, into some of the more uh, out there kinds of things. And so... I've had, you know, how old am I now? Nearly 50. So I've had 30 years of of, of immersing myself in the 1960s. Um, And it didn't take me long before I got um, started reading stuff about the Manson family and groups like that. And and the the process are mentioned in those writings. But for some reason, the, the name just had not stuck. So I'd read Helter Skelter. They're mentioned in there. I'd read The Family. Um, Ed Sanders' book, they're obviously mentioned prolifically in there. But I don't know why, but the, the name hasn't stuck. And then I was out making um, a, a true crime documentary out in the States, and I was talking to a, a, a true crime writer. It was actually about the um, Ramirez uh, Night Stalker case. But he just dropped this kind of story in passing that he had been corresponding with the Manson family in the early 70s because they wanted him to write their story and this was squeaky and sandy which i'm I'm sure many of your listeners would be familiar with and i i've always found the manson family story terrifying i mean i've done all sorts of films about all sorts of terribly nasty people but the only one that i ever have nightmares about is the manson family and the creepy crawling and all that spooky stuff um, so I said to him, weren't you, weren't, you, weren't you scared of these people? And he said, oh, no, I was never really scared of them. But the people that really scared the shit out of me were the process. And then he told me about this group that he would have encountered, I, I think, in Miami, in the black robes with the German shepherd dogs and this theology of some kind of unity of Christ and Satan. And that kind of sucked me in instantly and then I I, from that point on I wanted to find out more and I thought this extraordinary story I mean the 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 60s has been absolutely mined for for stories and so I thought well here's an incredible story that seems to have disappeared apart from the kind of the, the online conspiracy theorist stuff it's not a common known story and given you know they had many celebrity visitors and to the to their uh, coffee house and chapter in London in the 60s, and of course picked up uh, admirers like George Clinton uh, in the early 70s. Why has this story uh, not been told? And I, I was absolutely convinced that it had. It must have been somebody must have made a film. Somebody must be making a film. But then I reached out to some ex-members, and they said no. Somebody has tried to make a film, but it never came off. And it just felt like the right thing for me to do. It's such a good story. Um, from so so many different angles, from the real story of the real, the human story of all the people that were involved, and also the fictional story is fascinating as well, and how that came to be, and how that almost exists in its own right. The myth will never go away, I don't think, and I think that's um, a really interesting aspect to their story, and probably fairly unique to the to the process. Definitely, yeah. And uh, just to throw this in there, I first heard of the group in that Helter Skelter book, so that was my first uh, run across with them. So, Edward, as a former member, I'm curious how you came to know the group. Where were you? What were you doing when you first heard of it? I want to answer that question, but there's one point I would like to make here before we get further into this. You've got to grasp the fact that 90% of people who write about us online or put the conspiracy theories about just don't seem to notice. The glaring fact is we were an English group. We did not come out of the turmoil of the U.S. situation in the 60s with the civil rights movement. We were not 
affected directly by the Vietnam War because Britain wasn't involved in that. Rather, everyone who formed this group, and this is in the pre-psychedelic era, just before the, the whole eruption of flower power and everything else, had been shaped by post-war Britain, which was a society that was not at all religious. Britain had lost its empire during their childhood, or in my case, just as I was you know, starting to become conscious. And it was also a society that was not quite sure where it was going to go. Now, if you can remember that fact about the process, anything else begins to make more sense. We were, when we came to North America, immigrants bringing our own internal culture to North America. We were not Americans who had grown up with the type of religious background that most people on the continent had been through. As far as myself, I was in that sort of situation of not knowing really what I could believe. My parents had been raised Anglican, which is kind of the same thing as Episcopalian, which meant there was really no um, religious faith at all there, nothing functional. Um, more or less in my generation, you assumed you were an atheist with a few exceptions. You were still kind of trying to answer those big questions, but you didn't have any symbolic vocabulary to um, put all this together. So when the aforementioned Timothy Wiley came up to myself and a friend outside a rock concert in London in 1967, selling magazines, and I just bought one off him, it was very strange to me that somebody was not only answering philosophical questions, but was actually coming up with a lived way of bringing this to life, actually saying we've got a particular theological position that no one else has got. Um, we don't flinch from the idea that humanity might be destroying itself. We think that there is enormous transformation happening globally. But it was addressing me as an English person, having grown up in England, and I was being addressed by English people who'd grown up in England. So all of that hit me like a ton of bricks, and I was just infatuated by this. It was something I had not encountered, which was a philosophical position with a very strong spiritual backup to it that gave it a kick, that gave it total originality. And as I got closer to people, I realized there was also, this is the, the deep scandal of the process, a certain sense of fun to it which if you go online, nobody can imagine that we were having fun or that we had a sense of humor or that we could make ironic jokes about our own belief system. But I soon began to pick up that that was part of the culture, and that was what intrigued me. So eventually, when I was psychologically primed a couple of years later, I came in and joined the thing and did my, my two years with the group before hitting a certain level of disillusionment and and moving on out. Yeah, in the film, you said that you knew going in this was a brainwashing call, but that didn't really stop you. I just thought that was kind of funny. Jeff, do you have any questions right now about what they've said so far? Um, yeah, that point that you make about being an English group is very well taken. And I wonder, based on that, did the, the spread of the group from that point feel like a missionary purpose that you had this theology, this belief that humanity had betrayed itself, that it had become damned, cursed, was annihilating itself, and the process had a, a vision for for a way of salvation. And then it was was it then your true earnest, even though you had this irony and self deferential position, was there an earnestness in taking that salvation message in a missionary sense across the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that was very much what it was about during my time in. In the earlier phase of the more formative phases, the group was looking for its own people who were somehow out there in the mass of humanity and needed to be found and brought to their, uh, their true spiritual family. By, we had a theological shift in 1970 where we became a lot more open. The group was more 
it took on a more extrovert orientation and became far more of a missionary organization. You could become a lay member where you couldn't before. You either had to give up absolutely everything and join this group. And if we were going off to Mexico, okay, that's where you're going. And if we're all going over Europe, hitchhiking from Holland to Germany, well, that's fine. That's what we're going to do. And, you know, eventually everybody pulled out to North America where it was felt there would be a more receptive public for what we offered. So, yes, there was that feeling. There was also, I think, among all of us who joined around my time, I joined in 1970, that we valued the community. I mean, far far more than, oh, let's go and do a missionary thing. It was more of a thing of... I really like these people. They seem to understand who I am. They're helping me understand and and accept who I am. And I just want to hang out with these folks. If we have to do something that's a missionary effort, going out on the street every day, selling magazines, spreading the message, etc., well, that's necessary to provide an income for the group. But the internal dynamics of the thing, the internal relations, the sense of being bonded into this hierarchically arranged tribe or clan, that was the big draw. Not that I wanted to go out and tell people the world was ending. I think it'd be important at this point really to, you know, lay down some of the, the basic metaphysics of the theology. And I think when, once you understand that message, it's it becomes a whole lot easier for me to understand how somebody would feel compelled to to join a group and to do you know go to the extremes that you guys went to i think if you just come into this like just with the garbage that's written online and the conspiracy theories it just doesn't make any sense and it really takes kind of a somebody from the inside explaining like just from the fundamentals what the draw was and what was happening in the world that made that message seem like it was very potent and real basic thing again was acceptance of self most of the people i knew who came in were having some difficulty in making sense of life we weren't uh, necessarily people who'd messed up or couldn't support ourselves or couldn't maintain a human relationship but we were looking for something that made life meaningful in a world that had largely dropped the values that um, our grandparents would have known There was nothing particularly to adhere to. The theology arose from the psychological explorations because it was a psychologically oriented group with a strong orientation around the idea that we are all at root choosing the existence and the nature of the existence that we are living through. By learning to see how compulsively we deflect ourselves from our core purpose, which will vary from person to person, we could become more at peace, more aligned to whatever we individually considered to be God or meaning or purpose, and thereby achieve some kind of inner spiritual equilibrium. From this exploration arose this complex theology of Jehovah, Lucifer, Christ, and Satan as different ways of orienting toward that kind of an understanding. Everyone's got their own approach to things, and the only sane thing to do is to, rather than try and get everyone in one big ball of wax, recognize that everybody has this different kind of orientation, and the permutations are innumerable. What was your, everybody took on two prominent roles. I didn't hear in the film or in your essay the two deities that you associated with. You didn't take them on so much as actually being these things. You were born this way, and the theory was you had come to this point through various you know, past incarnations where you'd formed a particular stance on, on life. I would have been typed as Jehovian the Christian. That is, I had a rather negative view of myself, a lot of self-blame, a lot of self-reduction. So that was the negative side of Jehovah, just as Jehovians can also be highly reliable, highly dependent. 
I mean, here I am half a century later still, at least, you know, maybe not flying the flag for the process, but certainly standing up for it. The Christian side of it was more a desire always to maintain a balance so that things can be unified, to um, extend kindness, uh, which could either be a positive expression of something or could be just simple weakness and an avoidance of conflict. So those were, you know, I, I've just summarized about 129 characteristics of my own nature in two little tropes, but that was how I would have eventually analyzed myself as being a Jehovian Christian. Then if you were on the other side, you were more oriented towards success in the world. You might not have a theological concept. You might think that nature was really the divine. Listen to Bjork. She goes on about the fact that although she's not religious, she thinks that nature itself is divine. I'm not accusing her of being a Luciferian, if it is an accusation, but that would be a typical Luciferian stance. Somebody like her, she plays with imagery, she plays with all kinds of ideas, just to playfully, to see what, what reaction she gets. She's very much out there in a constant exploration of different aspects of human life. Very much a Luciferian way of looking at it. The satanic perspective split in two directions because Satan was seen as the principle of separation as Christ was seen as the principle of unity. So the Satanist is either the person heading to self-destruction, and who the hell cares, Charlie Manson being a classic example of that, drugs, sex, violence, disaster, destruction. And the other extreme, you had somebody trying to be the soul detaching from all bodily and mental conflict. So you've got the mystic, you've got the super disciplined Zen master, you have the spiritual magician, you have people who write certain kinds of wild science fiction because they're in worlds beyond the human. The Christian thing is to try and balance those two things. The Jehovian, the satanic urge is to separate things out so that you have valid separations as well as just conflict. took a while to master it. I can remember spending six or eight months after I joined really figuring out what all of this meant. So when people look at it at first, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It takes time to realize what these actual dynamic principles are in practice. Yeah, and one more thing on the theology here. I believe you guys said, and maybe this was from Timothy's book, I'm not sure if it was mentioned in the film or not, but the theology grew out of these group meditations. Were you part of those, Edward? I haven't joined at that point. The gods emerged when everyone had taken off to find paradise in 1966 and ended up uh, just outside Chuburna Puerto on the coast, the uh, coast of the Gulf of, U of uh, Yucatan, on the Gulf of Mexico. Stuhl is the smallest dot on the Mexican map even today if you go down there. They already had a sense that they were being guided by something they called the beings, but from Stuhl, the, the idea of Jehovah and then Lucifer emerged Satan came in after. Christ was kind of a vague entity for some time until he or it was recognized as the fourth God around 1970. But I personally hadn't joined at that point when all of that was being put together. I'm wondering if um, the eschatology aspect of it, was there a deep belief that the apocalypse of, or some sort of, you were on the brink of a true collapse and like in the way that some other groups are was were like deeply and seriously apocalyptic yes <laughs> the answer to that's obviously <laughs> yes we saw the world as ending but i think that rather morphed it was only a few years but i think given the intensity of the experience that the founding members had it seemed to take a very long time going from the idea that you know, everyone had grown up, as I said, in the post-war world. The founders were all little kids during World War II. So they had been in Britain, most of them, with bombs falling around them, with the threat of German invasion at any moment, with the fear that even if Germany didn't invade, Britain would lose the war. We know how the war ended, but it was only about the end of 1944 when everyone began to think we actually might 
for sure win this thing. From that physical destruction, ecological destruction, overpopulation and starvation, nuclear war, all of that, the realization came that this all stems from a particular set of assumptions that we make about the wrongness of everyone else. We reject the idea that we have ourselves chosen to be what we are and to undergo the experiences we undergo. This is just not responsible. It's only when you take responsibility for all that you are as an individual that it's possible to create a society that is not, as we describe it, human. And we use the term human for conflicted and contradictory sets of values that obviously excluded any meaningful God in the, the midst of things. Therefore, our job was to sort out what the dynamics were in all of this. Our theology was our answer to that question and to await the collapse of all of these human structures that were cropping up, the wars, the war machinery, the exploitation of the planet, and so on. Let's bring Neil back in. Neil, I hope you've been enjoying the soccer game there. Let's talk two, about... 2-0, two 2-0 nil, two nil to England. <laughs> all right. Absolutely. There you go. So, uh, you know, we've mentioned the founders. You mentioned them during that, that answer, Edward, and Jeff mentioned Robert de Grimston earlier. Let's talk a little bit about... Robert Moore, a.k.a. Robert de Grimston, and Mary Ann, the two founders of the group. And Neil, could you explain, I guess, the process grew out of their experience and sort of um, expulsion, maybe, from the Church of Scientology. Could you tell us a little bit about that story and if there were any Scientology roots that came with them when they started the Process Church? Yeah, I can tell you what I know and what I've obviously been told by former members that were early early joiners. Um, Robert was, you know, from a from a well-to-do family, not a, not extraordinary aristocracy, but an absolutely well-to-do family in England, a kind of traditional family. And he uh, was an architecture student. Um he he'd actually done national service in Malaya, so he's a bit older than everybody else that uh, subsequently joined. I think clearly an ambitious man and also somebody that was very open to new things. He had got, I think, a, probably a fairly normal life. He was studying architecture. He had a family. He had children. And then he met Marianne, who is a slightly mysterious figure, Scottish, had by that time moved to London and was said to have been moving uh, in circles, in the kind of Christine Keeler type circles. So escorts or kind of prostitution, but in in a but but no one would admit it was prostitution. That kind of thing. So, but but Robert met her in, um, in Scientology, and I don't think either of them were involved for very long. They were both at uh, Saint Hill. But I think it was only really a matter of months. It's actually Robert's bro um, brother who had initially got involved with Scientology. He'd had some need for some sort of help. And uh, Robert's brother, had, uh, Rob Robert's father, I think, had seen that, um, that Scientology had sort of been quite successful for that. And so Robert checked it out and they met there and connected in some way. Now, what, whether they felt that they could change the world for the better or change people for the better or whether they thought this is a terrific business idea that Hubbard's got going on here I'm not so sure I think life is never that clear is it so I suspect there's a bit of uh, everything involved there but Robert left his family hooked up with Mary Ann and together they they left Scientology I don't know if they were kicked out of Scientology I think they um, the story is that Mary Ann uh, realized that her sessions were being bugged or listened to which um may be standard practice i don't know and had enough and they both thought that they could take some of what they'd learned in scientology and adapt it to form their own form of therapy and that was all uh, compulsions analysis was their kind of uh, therapy model and business model and it was very much set up as a business with investors and um, they set up in london as a kind of uh, what would you call it? A kind of therapeutic, kind of like a, a maybe a Harley Street doctor sort of setup. But but then that seemed to very quickly change as as they 
brought in friends that they'd met, friends like Timothy Wiley, along the way to sort of test their theories out. Um, and this community sort of grew around that, looking deeply in, into the inner workings of each other's brains. I've probably waffled a bit there, but um, <laughs> but yeah. So that was so they became the kind of teachers and the guiding lights of the process. Even though Marianne was never uh, really that visible after a certain time to anybody outside of the process, and to many people within the process as well. In the book, uh, Love, Sex, Fear, Death, it's, it does say in the timeline, 1965, that uh, Hubbard declared Robert and Marianne suppress, suppressive persons for their innovation use of the e-meter. So I think there was some... Sort of- yeah, I think, yeah I, think, I, think, I think as soon as they left, they were uh, declared suppressive. That's my understanding. As many people that leave Scientology are, then kind of uh, their reputation is blackened. So, so I, I, think, I don't think they were kicked out. I think they left oh. and then they were declared somebody you shouldn't associate with. Well, they had some other ways of using the e-meter, is that correct? That they, they thought even Hubbard didn't really understand the full potential of it? If I could butt in on that one. The main thing with Marianne's objection was that Hubbard was trying to clone himself in every Scientologist. So a lot of people have left Scientology over this. They felt that you know, I am being asked to conform to too many ideas. Compulsions analysis was set up as a much more freewheeling thing, so that a lot of people were still getting um, answers to the e-meter questions with the, the system that Marianne and Robert developed that were purely agnostic or purely atheistic. One person I knew who became a confidant of Marianne, she told me that she suddenly started getting stuff charging on this e-meter about God and Christ. And she said, I, I'd never been religious before. I had no idea where this was coming from. But Marianne's looking at me and saying, well, that charged, that charged. The whole thing came together from everyone in that original group. I think there was definitely a kind of sort of spiritual orientation because they come out of Scientology, which admits or believes that every one of us is one shard of a total, vast, cosmic, godlike, amorphous, absolute everythingness. Kind of sort of somewhere between some forms of Hinduism, some forms of Mahayana thinking, and some forms of theosophy, all in a big mishmash. But they did keep on developing new ideas, new chains of questioning, and I know that they abandoned the standard way of looking for engrams that Scientology did. They felt that there were other things to trace down through the levels of the, uh, the unconscious in order to pull out the core realities, the core conflicts that all of us have. When did Robert and Marianne become the Omega? I don't know, but it would have been after the Stuhl experience, I would imagine. I mean, for a start, it was compulsions analysis, and then they became the process about 64, 65, after a year or so of that, because they'd begun in uh, early 1963. Then the thing began to take on some of the trappings of a sort of esoteric order, although that's not the real model that we were following closely. Then, in order to get non-profit status in the States, the process became the process, church of the final judgment. And I, I name that they insist they didn't even choose for themselves, but they just accepted because that was what their um, lawyer came up with. And I believe that it was then around about 68, 69, that that term, the Omega for Robert and Marianne together arose. But I, one of the difficulties I've had is when I've asked former members when things have happened, I've often found my own memories are more accurate than theirs. A lot of stuff is just lost in the, the mists of time now. That isn't a dig at other people, but I happened to write out my own story early on, and I started collecting historical information about the process. So I, I've always had an archive there that I could uh, fact check against. I think uh, for me, I, I, what I find interesting is something that uh, Edward touched on there, and I'd, I'd be interested to know what he thinks. It seems to me that those early members 
all brought something to the table in a way. So this was not a guru handing down a theology that they had in their heads and were kind of just laying before their followers. It seems to me that Robert and Marianne were very good at drawing things out of all the different individual members and creating something out of that. And so I think that's why there seem to be so many different uh, facets to the process and its theology, because to me it feels like it's come from those members within it and then been shaped by the Omega. Do you feel that might have some some truth, Edward? Uh, Definitely, yeah. I think Marianne was always the most capable controller of the whole thing. She was holding the reins, but neither she nor Robert knew exactly where they were headed. Robert, in interviews way back, and I think for that book, Satan's Power by um, Sims Bainbridge, said, you know, I knew where to go. Uh, Sorry, she knew where to go. I knew how to get there. I could figure out a way of putting this together into a coherent philosophical whole. But it was all of these other senior people who became the, the inner circle, maybe 10 or 12 insiders in a sort of secondary group around them who were contributing their own experiences, which became incorporated into this collective philosophy. It arose out of everybody, and no one person was the author, even if Robert and Marianne were pulling things together up at the top. Do you think that there would have been people in that initial group, some who would have been really interested in the occult, some that had a more of a religious background, maybe, others that were into into psychotherapy or, or Jung or Adler or things like that. So that they were all bringing a little bit of, of what, what they were up to before banding together, do you think? Generically, yes, I agree with your statement, but I don't think anybody, with the possible exception of Marianne, had any occult experience at all when they came in. Anyone I ever spoke to in the senior ranks, they had no idea what ceremonial magic or um, any of that stuff was about. I don't believe anyone had actually gone for formal psychotherapy or psychoanalysis. People came in, they were, they were a bright crowd. The, the general IQ level in that leadership group was quite elevated. But in terms of self-exploration stuff, there was a remarkable dearth of actual experiential background. Everyone got what they got from the, the psychotherapeutic approach that Robert and Marianne were taking with the e-meter and later with you know, discuss, discuss, discussion of ideas. Then it was producing these individual spiritual perspectives. And Marianne, I think, was a wonderful observer of this and knew how to tease things out of people, both to manipulate them, but also to get people to open up to what our deepest anxieties and desires are. It's very hard to ask somebody, what is it you really want spiritually? And It's not, I want to go to heaven. It's usually something around, I want to have a relationship with the universe that enables me to observe it with love and wisdom or something like that. But everyone's got a different take on that. So all of that was coming out from these sessions. Robert and Marianne were the only people who knew the whole picture. And they were therefore creating the whole ball of wax out of these elements but certainly the different personalities that people had at the, the inner circle were quite strongly developed and emphasized and combined into this overall smorgasbord of a uh, philosophical stance and later uh, formal theology. I like in the film where, where we have Genesis Peorge says that Robert was channeling something in his writing, that, that he was tapping into something and, and through his writing was channeling some sort of cosmic information. I, I mean, I get that impression too when I read it, but I also, I see it just a great writer with a great imagination at the same time. What maybe was the combination of Robert's study of other systems and his own imagination blended in with maybe some perhaps true divine channeling that that happened at Stuhl or in through the meditation sessions that ended up 
being the writings like As It Is and A Candle in Hell and, and all the logics that were written? I don't think anyone knows what his full background was, but I don't have the impression that he had studied metaphysics and gone off to sit at the feet of gurus in India or anything like that. He was a very, very bright guy with an extraordinarily vivid imagination. And I think what the process was, was a collective entity that was vastly more than the sum of its parts. It brought something together that was vivid, that was energized, that was shocking even to the participants at times. Some of the craziness of Scientology carried over and it's Scientology has a willingness to envisage the most bizarre and horrifying uh, cosmos out there. And some of that passed over. Robert, I think, just put a wonderfully civilized gloss on things. Marianne provided emotional juice and an absolute no-nonsense Scots woman's view of it all. Exactly where things came from to Robert, I think it was just the whole collective impetus of all of these people who were so into each other that there really was a group consciousness ruling the whole thing, a group mind. So it wasn't just one person, even if Robert and Marianne were, were steering things. It was the whole group entity tended to bring out the stuff that Robert was able to articulate in his writings. Yeah, let's stay on Marianne for just a moment, because uh, in the book that Jeff referenced, uh, Love, Sex, Fear, Death, Timothy notes, I think it's Timothy, that the group was actually a matriarchal cult that worshipped Marianne. Would you guys say that that is true? And was that evident while you were in the group too, Edward? No. With all due respect to Timothy, for whom I had enormous affection, I knew him for 50 years, and I, I still miss the fact that he's gone from the world. That was his experience. He bonded with Marianne, but Robert had been his friend at architectural college. He could not see Robert as the teacher, to give Robert his proper title. He could not see Robert as a fount of spiritual wisdom, whereas Marianne was a phenomenon. She was just able to read people, and she found just, you know, Timothy had a wonderful, crazy side. He, he always felt he'd come from another planet, another level of the cosmos. She was the first person who identified that secret self that he had inside, and that was the link between them. There was a lot of worship toward Marianne. Some of the people definitely put her on a higher plane or uh, as a more important individual than Robert. When I was in, though, Robert still commanded a large degree of respect from most of the inner circle. It was oddly unified and at the same time diversified. Choosing my words a little carefully here, because some of the people that contributed to that book, Love, Sex, Fear, Death, have said things. Like, I, I know that such and such was going on. I can see so and so about the process and all its failings. At the time, though, when we were in, we were all mesmerized by this experience. We all felt that Robert really was articulating deep spiritual truths. And I can remember people being emotionally overcome by the seeming deep insights that his writings offered. So, yeah, a lot of the time the matriarchal thing focused on Marianne, and it was Robert who got kicked out in 1974. It was not her. She stayed with that circle of the inner core around her till the day she died. But just saying it was a matriarchy, no. We always aimed with our self-image and our public image to emphasize the balance of opposites. The, the unity of opposites was, was our, our theme song, if you will. Now, you yourself wrote in a chapter that I loved in Love, Sex, Fear, Death, and you talked about being sort of on the fence for a while, like hanging around, going to some meetings, but the, it wasn't until you had a, your own sort of inner voice of Christ that came to you that really was the threshold that, that kind of pushed you over the precipice of joining. What was that like? <laughs> it was strange because I, I'll try and tell this quickly. I worked on my local newspaper, and a lot of what I was doing was going around churches, talking to churchmen about, you know, social activities in the parish and stuff. So even though religion was declining, there, there, there was still a strong 
presence or authority that the various churches held. This was the first direct exposure I'd had to religion, and I found it very disturbing because it was obviously about something powerful because some of these were people who'd really had uh, deep faith experiences. And I became quite paranoid about the idea that maybe this awful Jesus thing could one day overwhelm your psyche. This dreadful archetype would rise up and would squash any kind of intellectuality or cultural orientation or desire to experiment. I had a very Jehovian view of what God would be. I just fell in line with that. Eventually, that did break for me, and it happened at a midnight meditation in May of 1970, and it just came out of the blue. I, I was doing fine. I was beginning to get over this religious paranoia that I'd acquired, and I self-described as a Buddhist, even though I liked, still liked the people of the process, and they were fun to hang around with. And I just went into this meditation, and suddenly I was overwhelmed by this feeling of utter uselessness, utter worthlessness, utter failure, and everything awful. And I just collapsed at that point, and it was necessary to deal with what had come up. I decided that obviously it had happened at the process chapter in London, therefore they were going to be the people I had to now go and join I'd considered joining them the year before, then I thought, nah, 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 I, I don't want to do this, don't want to do this, I do not want to do this, I don't do it, are you listening? I don't want to do this. So, of course, I went ahead and did that. The actual sense of a voice consistently speaking in my mind came later that same year in December of 70 when I actually panicked and got very depressed again. I was good at getting very depressed and ran off for three days, and what came was this individual voice in my head that I felt was my guide and which I identified with Christ. That was there with me right through that process experience and in a certain way has remained with me ever since, but I don't necessarily put a theological label on it at this point. I didn't come across anyone else who'd had a born-again experience and joined the process. Everyone I ever asked said, well, you know, I, I like Father so-and-so, or, you know, I just feel better when I'm hanging around these people, or, you know, I just felt that these people could really, you know, appreciate who I am or accept who I am, and that was what drew most people in. I don't know of anyone else uh, who had the spiritual experience that was the actual crisis that made them join. Maybe other people did, but I don't know them. So one of the things that drew me into the group just to learn more about it, was the artwork associated with it. And I'm talking specifically about the magazine because I find that to be maybe the most powerful vehicle for personal change or transformation, just this this art in general. And I was curious what you guys made of the Process magazine the first time you encountered it. How much of an influence did it have on your approach to the group or the people in it or the messages or whatever you may have taken from that. And let's go back to Neil real quick and get him back in. Neil, what did you make of the magazine the first time you really encountered it? As, as somebody who loves the, the 60s, of course I adored them because they're so of their time and the you know, design work is excellent. So that's ignoring the, the, you know, the actual the words on the page. Just visually, they're great. And I've got a couple of, in, of them in front of me now. I've got the... Um, Freedom of Expression, 1967 magazine with Marianne Faithful on the cover. It's a beautiful piece of design work. And then you, you open it up and then I think this is what's interesting is in a way, the biggest legacy of the process is with those magazines because the, this whole new layer of people being interested and involved and inspired by has pretty much all come from the magazines because, because there was nothing really um, left from the process other than the magazines floating around. People have kind of explored it and made up their own minds from those magazines. And a whole kind of visual culture has come out of it, hasn't it? I mean, you would probably know that better than I because I had not come across the process until that moment I explained earlier on. So I, I had none of this kind of baggage of the conspiracy theories or the industrial music, or any of that. I, I was completely unaware of it. Now I see it's all over the place, of course. But the magazines themselves, 
are incredibly, certainly the earlier ones, incredibly provocative. Very difficult to actually kind of, unless you 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 understand some of the theology from the outset, they're very difficult to make sense of and very easy to misinterpret. And I think a lot of that negative legacy is a result of these little snapshots in time that these magazines are. But what is evident through all of them is the sense of humour. I think there's a, a really uh, interesting thing I've just opened up here in that 1967 issue. It's already kind of pressing buttons and provoking. There's a two-page spread about the process paranoids course. <laughs> um, I'm looking uh, at the same one myself right now. Uh, are you? Well, yeah. it's, it's extraordinary. And, and I think it's very revealing because amongst the humour there is also a sense of, built into that, a sense of kind of hubris, a sense of self-righteousness. It's a mixture of all the kind of human elements, I think, of the people that were writing this stuff. So it it begins, do you have nightmares about giant bats sitting on top of Process House? There's a great big picture of Process House, which was the the chapter house in London, the headquarters, and they've got a, a caped figure that has been long before Photoshop, but I'll use that phrase, Photoshopped onto the top in a kind of Christopher Lee-style Dracula-esque pose. Do you think members of the process are brainwashing charlatans? Do you think the process is out to get you? Are you afraid when you get in a taxi that it has been specially sent for you by the process? When you lose something, do you automatically assume that a member of the process has dematerialized it? (laughs) <laughs> Do you spread rumours that the process practices voodoo and black magic? Do you often become ill? Are you considerably more interested in your own reputation than your children's welfare and fulfilment? Have you dedicated your life to destroying the process? Do you blame all your troubles on the process? Are you afraid the process will take over the world? And it goes on. Are you afraid of Alsatian dogs? Do you keep seeing process symbols everywhere? It, it's it's wonderful, isn't it? Have yeah. you made up your mind whether the process is evil and dangerous or well-meaning, misguided and, and ineffectual? It's like they must have, you guys must have known back then, like this, this whole, all the paranoia that exists today and the conspiracy theory about what are they really and what is their evil, nefarious intentions. It, it's like right back here in the origins that seemed very much like they were addressing it at the time. Well, we found it in ourselves. Well, when you start looking at your own compulsions, you begin to find megalomania under the surface. You want to control immense amounts of your own environment. And you find that you have these huge levels of cosmic anxiety, like I just described with my own conversion experience. So it wasn't about the world out there being paranoid. The joke was one we shared. We have found this in ourselves. That was how it comes across with the, this uh, this wacko sense of conviction. We, we knew what we were talking about. Uh, what I find wonderful about it as well is that there's, in some way there's an, em- an embracing of those images and those conspiracy theories or a devil may care, to use a phrase, attitude to it. So there's nothing in, in this two-page spread here that says, no, we're not, we're lovely, we're nice people. There's something in there that's constantly hinting about, you know, well, maybe we are, maybe we're not, maybe you just don't know, but it's a series of kind of prods and finger pokes that is, what's the right word for it? It's kind of incredibly mischievous, but with a sense of self-righteousness about it, I think. I'd go along with that. Yeah, it's like if you understand uh, Aleister Crowley and Dada, which which it's mentioned in the film that the process is a combination of those things. It's like you you, you understand at that point, like the way that Crowley played with people in his writings and the way that he did that same sort of am I the devil or am I not? You know, <laughs> am I Christ? It's like I get it, you know, and it's like because I have an art history background and, and PR background, it's like I can see it and understand the sophisticated level of communication that they were operating at, where all these other people are very gullibly falling for a trap into, you know, this paranoid Illuminati kind of nonsense. People are paranoid, though. I mean, that that is one of the reasons we felt that the world was disintegrating, because the levels of fear in humanity were, are, were, and are magnifying. 
the fourth issue of the magazine, uh, sorry, the fifth one, was on the topic fear. The whole issue was about fear. The problem we ran into was that while we were used to dealing with these concepts, not, and not just concepts, but these feelings in ourselves, it was what we were exploring, presenting that to the public freaked people out more than we fully appreciated when we, of course, had come over to North America, first as a sort of small expedition in 1968, but then permanently in 1970 and thereafter, we were in a society that didn't get that kind of humor that we brought to things and that took God and Satan and Christ as much more important factors in the life of people. We then started producing a reaction from people who simply couldn't get what we were on about. And I have often said, I, I think we were just oblivious to how much hurt we were going to cause ourselves from this. People just thought it's 100% serious, could not get that self-referential, ironic level of things underneath and you know, the, the whole conspiracy theory stuff, the whole perspective out there that we continue somehow to interfere with world events and that we always were the real force behind Charles Manson, evil people, and the heartbreak of psoriasis continues. <laughs> we, we just, you know, it, it's part of what we generated. If we have to be true to our own principles, we have to acknowledge that we produced that sense that that process is an evil organization to be very wary of them. They're hiding under the bed. And I, I think that will continue for some decades yet. I, it, it's odd to me that we survived in public imagination when I figured we were, as uh, Neil remarked earlier, you know, a forgotten cult. <laughs> Why did we not just disappear like hundreds of other little communities? We're still getting things like you know, an invitation to be on this podcast. And it's fascinating to me, but you're always addressing the fact that it's an off-kilter perception. Well, I, I think, I think like, oh, uh, go ahead, go ahead, unlike other groups... The, the level of sophistication and the design work that Neil talked about and the, the provocative nature of the writings that, that Robert put out, I, I think it's, to me, that's what sets it apart from maybe a lot of other groups that have been forgotten is I think there's a still a deep resonance in, you know, the message that humanity is the devil and, and lives in fear and blame and is on the verge of disaster. It's like it couldn't be any more relevant now. You know, it's still so potent What what was what the message was. I guess we were 40 years ahead of our time or 50 years ahead of our time. In the game of the gods is a very important idea in the process. Could you describe what that was, what that means? Well, basically that God was everything. That was the core idea. That God, for the purposes of an experience, there was nothing on TV in heaven, I suppose. God splits itself. The principle of separation, as I said earlier, is what we call Satan, and God splits itself from the spiritual core, which is the soul end of things, into an actual manifest creation, which is the body end of Satan. They're okay, they're still in touch, because at this point, there is also what we call Christ. Christ and Satan had been the exact same entity when God was one entire integrated unity. Then, as things go on, there needs to be more of an interface between these two sides, the spiritual nature of God and the body, because they are kind of competitive. The body wants to ex exist without being ruled by um, spiritual principles that limit its, uh, its right to undergo all kinds of cool stuff. Therefore, Jehovah comes into existence as a mental a uh, reflection of the soul that is Satan. And Lucifer comes into existence as the mental reflection of the, the body, the physical universe. And, of course, every single shard of the cosmos is in some way an aspect of God. It is a being in its own right. Human beings are not the only conscious entities in this process and universe. 
But you've now got soul and body, a unifying essence, and you've got mind. You've got on the one side of the mind something that wants duty and discipline and struggle and suffering and expiation. And, you know, you've got to get back to God by being very obedient and, and suffering a lot. And then they've got the Lucifer side of things, which says, you know what, you, we can experience this wonderful cosmos. We don't have to be uh, weighed down with rules and precepts and death and nasty stuff. You know, we can just go on being happy in a lovely universe forever. Each of these is a spiritual principle that we call a God. It is also present simultaneously a different level within each and every human being. So every human being is subject to the pressures of these differentiated forces. This is the game of the gods. It's played out not with dueling Thor and uh, whoever up on the, the heaven level, but it's played out between human beings, between those who would free humanity from nasty religious restrictions and those who would rather set up the Inquisition and torture the sinners until they, they screamed and then they could be uh, satisfactorily burned and their souls would be saved. Everything that humanity has been through in its history, according to process theology, was about these different forces interacting in conflictual or allied form. Hey, let me jump in here real quick. We're about an hour and 15 minutes into our time. How much longer do you guys want to go? It's totally up to you. I can give this another half hour without a problem. I've probably got another 10 to 15 minutes in me because I need to, to get off somewhere, if that works for you. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, do you have a good uh, maybe final question for Neil then? Uh, yes, I, I guess in general, Neil, I mean, I know it's been a very long road from the, the onset and the pre-production and the production and the post-production. And I know I waited two years to, to finally get this wonderful DVD package uh, in my home to watch. I'm so it took, sorry it took so long. No, no, it was well worth the wait. But just from your end, on a, as the creator and the artist of this, what has been your experience, this labor of love, it seems like, and uh, what have you taken away from the experience of making the movie and getting to actually interface and interact with all these people who are firsthand witnesses to this group? I mean, I've absolutely loved, loved it. it. Um, and uh, on, two, on, on two or three different levels. One, when I started trying to make sense of... Uh, what the process was saying, which took me a, a long time, and I'm sure I haven't even got close to that. It made me look at myself and think about myself and think about the way my mind worked, and I found that extremely rewarding. I found the process of making the film extremely satisfying, and, and indeed the, the, the process of screening the film and meeting people involved in film festivals and, and different people around the world wonderful and the best thing of all is i've made some really great friends of ex processians that i really really cherish their friendship because they're fascinating people and they've got a lot of interesting stuff to say so 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 the best thing of all has been that really that the, the friends that i've made but as a film I'm, I'm very proud of it and i'm proud that it's been received really well that i think Despite the fact that it, it debunks a lot of conspiracy theories, I don't think that means it's not an exciting film. I think it's an entertaining film. I think it's an amazing story, an extraordinary story of extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. And, and as I say, I think that the kind of the mythical story is as interesting in its lack of truth. It doesn't mean it's not an interesting story as well. And that facet, I think, is, is, is really interesting. And... Would I do it all all again in the same way? I think I probably would. It's taken so long and, and been so personal that it's uh, become a part of me. So uh, I could have dashed it off quickly in a devil-may-care um, uh, way, but in, in fact, I decided to do pretty much everything myself on it in order to keep complete control um, and integrity within the film um, so it wouldn't be influenced by um, outsiders and I think that um, I'm, I'm really glad I made that decision in the end, despite the fact that I've kept people like Jeff waiting for so very, very long, and I feel awfully guilty about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all that craftsmanship and effort comes through uh, in the presentation of the film, and the integrity of the story comes through in, in people's stories like 
Edward and they're honest, you know, because now we finally have people speaking for themselves and we can see the earnestness in their eyes and their in the in their voice and what they'd say rather than, uh, you know, nonsense, third hand impressions. That was very important to me that I, I didn't want to put a narrator in there. I didn't want to put a lot of outside experts. There are one or two people in there that didn't have a personal encounter with the process. But the vast majority either were deeply embedded in the process or had a personal encounter with the process. Um, and it was really important to me that the story came from, from the source and is their story and not my story. So that was al always from the start. That was uh, the, the intention. And what's been wonderful and, and what is really satisfying to me is the reaction from uh, ex-members that have seen the film, members that weren't in, in the film but have since seen it, and it's it's been uh, universally positive, and that has really delighted me because it's their story, and I would hate to mess with their uh, for them to feel cheated by a telling of their own personal stories. So that's vastly satisfying, and and it's also formed a, a kind of um, a reunion club in a way because the film has led to a number of ex process scenes uh, reconnecting with each other and, and and renewing friendships, and I'm really pleased about that as well. On a very kind of basic level, that's the best thing that could possibly have happened. I think. I, I'd agree with that, Neil. I, what you caught was the absurdity of the process as well as the drama. And all of the people who see us as this really dark and uh, conspiratorial presence mixed up with blood and murder cannot grasp that we had this sense of our own ridiculousness a lot of the time. You managed to tune into that. And I think that's why ex-members have thought, OK, somebody finally gets it. You could have spent 12 hours doing a mini series on all of the teachings for everyone to fall asleep on. But actually getting the spirit of the thing and the way we interacted with each other, which was with a certain sense of care and concern, but also an ongoing idea of this is rather strange, isn't it? That was the thing that nobody else seemed to grasp. All right. So let me uh, jump in here and let's cut Neil loose so we can get off to where he has to be. Uh, Neil, before you go, tell people where they can find the film if they're interested. Oh, yeah, I'd be delighted to do that. Uh, you may have heard some cheering in the streets as well from where I am because uh, England are through to the semi-finals of the <laughs> of the World Cup, and uh, it's really quite extraordinary. And everybody's um, kids are running up and down the street outside, which is delightful. But yes, if you want to get hold of the movie, it's still screening in some places. So there's a website www.theprocessmovie.com that has details of up and coming screenings. I think the next one will be in, uh, hopefully, in Miami. So that'll be fun. But also, you can purchase it on DVD from that site and also from Amazon. So please, please do uh, get your wallets out. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. There's a lot of money to, to recoup. I'm a long way off paying back all the people I've borrowed money off to make the film. Well, it's well worth the 15 to 20 bucks for sure. And I think I speak for Jeff on that too. So Neil, thanks for being here, man. We'll cut you loose now. And then Edward, if you don't mind staying around for some bonus questions, uh, you're more than sure. welcome <clears throat> okay. to. All right. Hey, Jeff, are you hey, good thanks too? Thanks for having me on, Ryan. And, and great to talk, Jeff. And lovely to chat Edward again. And hope to see you again soon. Likewise, Neil. And there you have it. My thanks again to Neil, Edward, and Jeff for dropping by and hanging out and diving into a group that has long perplexed anyone who's ever taken an interest in them. If this tickled your feel spot in any way, I cannot recommend Neil's Sympathy for the Devil documentary enough. He really did give this story a fabulous, unbiased treatment. In the Patreon extension, I mainly turned things over to Jeff, and he and Edward chatted more about his time and experience with the process, and then Jeff and I finished out the chat with some personal reflections on the cult and the conversation and what we think a group like The Process would add to a culture that's, by most accounts, pretty fucking boring and stagnant. And that isn't me advocating for more cults. It's me advocating for more artistic and creative collaborations that push limits and dissolve boundaries and make unsafe statements. We don't need the neoliberal, safe space, social justice meme culture we're all drowning in. We need ideas and images and words and voices that shock that system back into coherence. And who knows, maybe guys like Jeff and myself could be the ones to do that. 
Anyway, a shout out to our newest patron, Matt. Thanks for hopping on board the esoteric endeavor. Much appreciated. If you'd like to join Matt and the now more than 130 patrons who have signed up to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash occulture. And if you join before September 1st, you'll be just in time to take part in Compendium, the official occulture book club. That's right, we gonna read some books. And we're starting with Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, considered one of Time Magazine's 100 best English language novels and described as a mind-altering romp through a future America so bizarre, so outrageous, you'll recognize it immediately. We'll also have a live recorded discussion at the end of the month for anyone who wants to join and that'll be posted for all to hear on Patreon. So even if you don't participate in the reading of the book, you can still hear the discussion about it afterward. Also, if you're a patron at the $10 and $20 levels, make sure you're checking your messages on Patreon because after you're a patron for two months, you get a free t-shirt and your coupon code is messaged to you. And I just sent the code to quite a few of you, so please check those messages to claim your free tea. Anyway, that's all my gratuitous marketing plugs for this time, which means I'm out of time. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself. Think for yourself and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.